Okay. I'm going to start with uh, this uh, demo uh, of connected consumer demo. It's the first demo of this project. The goal of this demo is to uh, show the, uh, the value of of the this component of the big data stack, data, data driven infrastructure and seamless analytic framework for an, an analytic process of retail product recommendation services. This demo is a long demo. I'm going to show you uh, a journey of the demo uh, because it's, it's easy to, to, to miss something. Uh, first of all, we are going to introduce the business case of, of the connected consumer. After then, we are going to talk a little bit about the DDIM uh, technology and the, and the underground. After then, we are going to to show how to model the process, the business process, uh, with a uh, analytic tool of the big data stack. Um, then we are going to to make the first deployments with a component of a DDIM. After then, we are going to show, to to show how the user, the analytics user, can uh, see the, in real time the the result of the analytic process. And we are going to simulate a, an incident, maybe a Black Friday incident in the in the web, in the connected consumer web. And how can we uh, adapt uh, the traffic, uh, the, the infrastructure to the traffic of the of the application with runtime adaptation. And we finish with a conclusion. I'm, I'm going to pass to Bernard uh, to introduce the, the business case. Okay. Uh, thanks, Antonio. I will share my screen then. Okay, before we go any further into the details of the different demos, uh, let's then uh, show some business context of the use case. Uh, the use case is is uh, is uh, centered on on the retail business, uh, which is a highly competitive market on which each customer matters. Uh, in the last years, for example, uh, there has been different uh, actors in the in the in the retail business, uh, ranging from regional actors to to global competitors, which uh, did not exist a few years ago. All of this has created a, a big. And a, and a need to different uh, and a need uh, to differentiate from other competitors. Uh, then uh, one of the of the important issues on which they can find this differentiation is by personalizing uh, the offer to their customers. Okay. Nowadays uh, it is still too simple uh, the personalization that they are uh, providing to the customers based only on on traditional and outdated customer segments uh, based only on, on their own historical data and not linked to, to, to the to tendencies or to the context of the navigation, for example, of the user in, in an e-commerce site. Uh, and for that reason, they are also unable to produce predictions at the right, uh, at the right pace, at the right reason. Uh, so predictive analysis for them uh, would be a, a, a good uh, a good solution to in order to to improve their customer experience and then to, to be able to adapt uh, the most appropriate messages to each customer and send only those promotions that best suits customer needs at the right time or for example predict the potential buyers for products of, or services like we will see in, in, in our use case. No? And in this way, uh, they could improve the shopping experience for their customers. Then, uh, what have we done uh, in, the, in the, within the use case? Uh, what we have been doing is we have been collaborating with Eroski. Eroski is one a real company, uh, one of the largest Spanish growth some physical stores. Uh, located all around Spain. Uh, we are in charge of, of maintaining their e-commerce and, and some of their loyalty mobile application apps. Uh, and what we have uh, been working on is in, in providing them a, a recommender system uh, running over big data stack that helps Eroski to personalize uh, products offer that they offer to their customers in, in their online channels, not only in the e-commerce, but also in the mobile applications, etc. And for that reason, uh, they may the the intention is that they increase the customer satisfaction and loyalty. Uh, 
Uh, in this uh, recommended system that we have been building during the project, we have been using collaborative filtering. We go further and we go into the details of what have we been implementing. Uh, basically, uh, the application of, of Warrain is, as, as Dimos explained in the, in the technical part of, of the presentation, is a composite application, which means that it's composed by different uh, application services, uh, each of them uh, with a with uh, with uh, with its own key performance indicator, uh, and um, and uh, in in our composite application, we have been building three different uh, two different models for for calculating the recommendations: a batch analytics model, which was implemented during the first half of the project, uh, then uh, we also implemented a, a real time. Um, service that uh, that allowed the applications of of Eroski to 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 get uh, recommendations to to for the customers. That all of this was done during the first half, and then in the second half of the project, we have been uh, moving from a batch uh, model to a real time analytics uh, model, and and uh, and this will be the 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 model that uh, that will be demonstrated later on. Okay, in this real-time analytics uh, model, what we do is to inject to, to simulate the, the navigation of a of a of a user in in the e-commerce site and 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 the update of the of the recommendations according to to the actions that he is doing in the in the in the in this e-commerce site. Okay, then if we go further it, and and. Uh, um, and thinking of the of the real time uh, model, uh, we, we are dealing with some uh, predefined uh, events. Uh, some of the, that that will be uh, appearing in in the in the coming uh, demos. These predefined events uh, are simulating the actions of the customer in the in the e-commerce site, and some of them produce a, a positive effect on the recommendations. Some others. Uh, produce a negative effect. A, a negative effect meaning that that the, this event means that the user does not uh, like uh, this product uh, or is or, or may not like the product. Okay, like for example, product removed from basket. No? Uh, from a business perspective, uh, in in big in 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 the model we we have been building, it would be interesting for us to to be able to prioritize some of these events. For example, the product recommendation remove, and this is something we will see also in the in the in the coming demos in the in the networking uh, demo. Okay. Uh, and what what are the 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 wonders that that big data stack providers uh, provide our use case? Uh, Big data stack allow us to set the to to analytics and recommendations with server service level objectives. As I said previously, the application is composed by different application services. We can set up uh, the 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 what what are the service level objectives and um, and the and big data stack is suggesting us from the first deployment uh, what are the required resources to achieve the service level objectives. And the and the way that the, the resources needs to be provisioned in terms of deployment patterns and orchestration, we also uh, want to that these resources are provisioned automatically. Uh, and thanks to a data-driven infrastructure layer, when we have a a, a burst of activity, for example, in, in the in in an e-commerce site, uh, the resources uh, would be automatically allocated and and, and needed to to be provided uh, manually by by. By by uh, data by by application owner, okay, uh, and we also want that uh, the time adaptations are made are made during runtime. No, there could be new data sources, different rates in the incoming data. The infrastructure needs to adapt automatically to accommodate these changes on the users, number of requests, and data analytics requirements. Like for example, uh, it, during during the past. Uh, Covid crisis, we we had sometimes a burst of activity in the e-commerce site and and uh, suffered for that because the, the the our platform our real platform was wasn't ready for that uh, and uh, and uh, we would like that 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 these uh, runtime adaptations are made automatically you know, so so that we don't have these problems. Okay, so I pass the floor to to Antonio. Yeah. 
Okay, we are going to demonstrate how different components of the data data driven infrastructure management collaborate in order to maintain the quality of service of the of the application. Um, we are going to see uh, also how uh, integrate with the rest of the layer of the big data platform, like data as, as a service and um, user interaction layer, like process modeling in order to, to model the, the process or analytic and data visualization to see in real time a uh, result of the of the analytics uh, process. Okay, I'm going to to share to stop sharing and uh, the next is uh, is Anesis uh, that he is going to show process modeling. Okay. Great. I'm going to take control of the screen. Uh, the starting point from the connected consumer case is uh, in every case. To be honest, this is of course the process uh, modeler. Business analyst logs in in this component, and uh, the outcome of this uh, component is to create a high level uh, process graph. Uh, the detailed uh, the details of this component are going to show, be showcased in a foreseeable use case. The smart and sweeter showcase. So, not to waste any time, for uh, the moment, I'm going to just showcase the functionality of the import of a graph. Uh, and by means of import, uh, we have already created some graphs, and now we can import them, export them, and re edit them. But uh, for the moment, as you can see, this is the generated graph for the connected consumer case. We have four services, four node services, the data filter, feedback collector, model update, and recommendation service. For each one of these services, uh, we, can, uh, we can fine tune them and assign different values uh, on a high level in this case. And as you can see here, we can also define the overall objectives. Let's assume that for this graph, we have the it can be either a one or a multiple values. So uh, when this the, the process of the high level creation of the graph is concluded, then the business analyst can, of course, export the graph and then uh, propagate it to, towards the data analyst by the invocation of the data toolkit. Uh, I'm going to stop this. This briefly concludes the invocation of this component for this use case. So. I will pass the floor to the data analyst uh, presentation of the data toolkit. Uh, so you get the graph is imported in the data toolkit and then the user the data analyst can fine tune and uh, define metrics, maximum values, uh, constraints and uh, SLOs. So now I pass the floor to Richard. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah. So. In this, yeah, and this, we'll need to figure out how we actually do the handover there because we might want to just you instead of switching people. But anyway, okay. Um, so let me just take over uh, with slides. Uh, I have this. There we go. Um, okay. So thanks, Anekis. So. What you've just seen is you've seen um, how the application engineer could use the data toolkit to effectively register an application with the realization engine. Um, and what the realization engine's role is now to enable that person to go and deploy, configure, and manage their application for runtime on a cloud or cluster environment. The realization engine is a new component that was developed um, over the last 18 months. And the idea here is that it tackles a significant technology gap in the current containerized ecosystem that became clear to us as we continue to build out big data stack. So effectively, what it does is it enables us uh, better tooling to be able to define complex applications and how we make alterations or deployments for those applications. So if we consider what we showed at M18, um, we initially had this linear flow of for the deploy or the definition through to deployment of the application, where we started process modeling and we ended at ADS deploy, which put the application onto the cluster. The realization engine is this new component, which sits just before deployment 
And what it does is it enables us to define all of the different components of the application, store those, track the state of those applications as they are running, as well as make runtime alterations. And that is all through a unified endpoint. So we're going to be focusing on this part of the, the demonstration here, where we've just got the, data, the output of this toolkit into the realization engine. So just as a quick summary of what the realization engine is comprised of and with the components that we're going to use for this demonstration, the realization engine has, has three main components. So it has the API, and what this does is it provides the primary logic for effectively registering apps, getting this current state of those applications, as well as triggering alterations to the application. We have the realization UI, which um, I'll demonstrate in a few minutes. And we also have a clustering monitoring service. And what that does is it communicates with the underlying cluster infrastructure to make sure that we have an up-to-date view on what the state of the user application is. It also provides um, a couple of additional um, services and to enable support for uh, tracking of cluster level metrics. So it has a resource monitor that collects information about um, the resource usage of pods and um, where that's available. And we also have a cost estimator for generating monetary value or cost values um, in cases where the cluster doesn't already provide that information. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this part here. So in terms of the ATOS Worldline use case, um, to understand what actually happens when we deploy or configure an app, we need to understand what actually comprises an application. And from the realization perspective, we can consider an application to be comprised of four main components. So first of all, we have objects, and these are effectively what we saw in the data toolkit. So these represent the, 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 sort of the core components of the application. So these are things like the programs, the sort of things that are going to be run, maybe networking configuration objects, as well as potentially data services, um, which you know, provide the data or allow us to store data. We then have actions. So actions effectively represent different alterations or configurations changes that we can make to the user application. Um, in terms of the realization engine itself, these are actually comprised of a series of underlying um, or atomic action or atomic alterations or operations. Um, and we can chain these together to form more complicated actions that can then be triggered by either the user or some program. We then have you know, service or pod level objectives. And what these do is these represent um, effectively the target quality of service that the user desires for their application. And we call these either um, service level objectives or pod level objectives. And practically what they do is they tie together a metric. So something, um, some uh, measurement that we're getting from the cluster and um, tied to a particular object with a predefined performance target. So what the, the user wants to achieve for that particular component. And then finally, we have resource templates. So if we have programs that we're going to deploy, um, then those will require resources to be obtained from the cluster. So these might be things like CPU and memory, or they might be more specialized resources such as um, GPUs. And so resource templates define what types of resources we're going to need from the cluster for each particular component. So what makes up the Connect Consumer um, application? Well, the Connect Consumer application is actually a very complicated um, application, which is one of the reasons why we need something like the realization engine to management, manage it. So if I just like highlight just the programs that run as part of the Connected Consumer, we have a feedback collector that retrieves uh, feedback events from these uh, storefronts. We have a Spark cluster, um, which is running underneath it, um, an update service, which is generating new recommendations. We have some networking infrastructure, and we also have the recommendation service itself, which is provide, serving the, the users by providing recommendations. There are then a bunch of other things in terms of the data and networking that I'm not going to talk about here for time. In terms of actions, we can do a few things. So we can deploy the entire um, application from end to end. We then have alteration actions that we can make at runtime. So we could add or remove recommenders to scale up or down the, the application. Um, we could also potentially alter the network configuration for the application to shape traffic or prioritize particular types of traffic. 
And we might want to enable um, automated orchestration for this particular application using the dynamic orchestrator so that we don't need to perform that manually. In terms of quality of service, what we care about is two main things. Uh, we care about the cost of the application, so we may have a cost limit associated to the application as a whole, and we also may have uh, or care about the response time that the user sees. So this could be for um, either generating recommendations or um, from the actual uh, feedback event system. And I'll talk about resource templates a bit later on. So with that said, let's move over onto the actual demonstration. So this is the, um, the realization um, UI. So what it does is it provides um, a, a, user, a nice user-facing endpoint to the functionality of the realization engine. So when you first arrive, um, you need to uh, specify what particular testbed or um, cluster that you want to connect to. Um, in this case, we're going to be connecting to the Boston testbed. So I've already got these fixed in here. So if I'm just go log into here, then this is the overview screen for the realization engine. It tells you information about the, the namespace or the, the project you're currently working in. And um, I'm not going to go over this in detail and um, you can find more about that in the uh, deliverables. But for this particular application, what we care about here is we care about um, the, you know, deploying the different components of the ATOS Worldline application. So if I go down here, um, so this one, we need to be careful. Yeah, that's gone and deployed twice. So we need to be careful about setting up. Um, so if we are deploying, um, yeah, the, the grocery recommender systems here, we can see this listed. And uh, this currently gives me information about the state and any actions that I can perform for this particular application. So we can currently see that there's no endpoints, no active deployments, or no end deployments for this particular application because we haven't deployed it yet. However, we can see that we have a range of different um, actions that we can perform. So these just correspond to the different actions that I discussed earlier. So I might be able to want to enable network controls or shape traffic um, or otherwise deploy the, app the application. So that's what we're going to do here. So in this case, what I want to do is I just want to deploy the entire ATOS Worldline application so we have a complex action to go and achieve this. So if I click this, this is going to um, start the actual um, or prepare us to start the action. And it takes us to this screen, which says, OK, we have some maybe configuration that we need to set to enable to provide this particular action. And because it's doing some complicated changes to the actual um, setup of the cluster. So the full deployment recommender, um, what it does is when we try to trigger an action, it goes and checks to see if there are parameters or resource templates that need to be set for this particular um, action. So in this case, we can see here we have a wide, wide range of parameters or variables that are either being set automatically as part of the uh, deployment process or can otherwise be configured by the user. Um, in this case, we have some that are set by default. The other thing that can be set here is resource templates. So for some actions, not all, um, these will create um, programs on the actual cluster. So these are things that generate containers, and those containers require resources. Now, for each of these, we need to provide a valid resource template specifying at minimum the required CPU and memory for each one of those. Now, this might be loaded from defaults that are provided as part of the action, but they also might be specified by the user. So at this point, I could come in here and I could specify, OK, how much um, CPU and memory that I want. However, if this was a new, you, a new application that the, maybe the application engineer has just um, developed, and they're not sure of what resources they might need for that particular application, then they might want to um, ask the, the Big Data Stack platform to generate um, a resource template for them. And this can be done using the uh, deployment recommender service. So if I click this button here, then this starts the deployment recommender service process. So just to give a quick recap of how this works, um, in the case where uh, an object inside of our system um, lacks a valid resource template, then the deployment recommender service can generate one of these for us. So the way this happens is it first of all requests a set of possible um, resource templates from the pattern generation component, which is part of the application dimensioning workbench, and then collects predictive benchmarking information 
from FlexiBench to use effectively as features to represent the different um, resource templates. And then it scores each of those templates based on their predicted suitability in terms of the user's quality of service constraints that they have provided. And then ranks those templates by suitability or predicted suitability, and then provides the, the best one for um, use uh, by or for the user. So if we go back here. So once I've done that, I can then save and I can then start the action because I've now finished configuring this action that's ready to go. And if I come into here, then I can get, look at, see the current state for the action that I have just triggered. So this is the action states view. What it does is for every application, it provides information about the different actions that either are currently running or have previously been running or in pending states. So we can currently see we have one running application here. This tells us about what the, the particular action is going to be doing. And it tells us, okay, what stages um, is it going through? So the deployment of the ATOS Worldline application is quite complicated. It contains 46 different stages. And we're currently in stage 43 of uh, 46. So what this is doing is this is deploying all of these different components that I mentioned earlier, such as the feedback collector. It's setting up the Spark cluster. It's deploying the recommendation update service onto that cluster. It's setting up the, the recommendation service as well as all the networking. So it's preparing all of these for us um, such that we don't need to deploy each of these manually. And this is one of the limitations that we find if you're just using a base installation of Kubernetes or OpenShift, because um, it doesn't provide you functionality to go and effectively represent these very complicated actions that make it much easier to actually manage these type of, these type of applications. So that's the, the application deployed. Um, so I can see here inside the, the recommender service, I can bring up complete. I can click on this and I can see, okay, here's all the stages that I went through. All of these are green, which means that they completed correctly. If they, there was an error, then these would show up in red and the action would cancel. But that's all of that is um, the application up and running. And so I go back here and I update my, my view for this. Then I can see now that we also have some endpoints that have been created. So there's the endpoint for the feedback collector and also for the Spark UI. And I can also get the state of the different um, active deployments. So I can see we've got feedback collector running. I've got Spark masters and workers. I've got a Zookeeper server. I've got all of the different components of the application and they are currently available. So that is us now deployed the, um, the user application. Um, and so I will now pass over to, um, is it George for the Bernat. Uh, Dimensioning Workbench? Bernat. Is it? Okay, it's Bernat for the Dimensioning okay. Workbench. Okay, thank you, George. I will share now my screen. Okay, so if, if you will agree, I will, I will start. Okay, uh, the intention of the demo is to show the, the application that has just been deployed by Richard uh, and to see how it works, how it is calculating the, and updating the, the model of the recommendations, as I explained uh, previously in my, in my introduction. Uh, but before we, we see the demo itself, uh, let's remember what the application is doing. Uh, this figure you can see here, it provides an illustration of the real-time grocery recommendation system. Each ellipse uh, in, in this diagram uh, represents a pot. Uh, from an external perspective, and the system has two endpoints. A recommendation provider, which responds with recommended products for a user, and a feedback collector, which receives clicks and purchase events generated by the user in the e-commerce site. Uh, when a login user opens a home page in Eroski e-commerce, a request is sent to the recommendation provider endpoint which retrieves grocery recommendations for that user from a Linux scale database. On the other hand, and in the meanwhile, uh, when a user clicks or purchases a product, an event is sent to the feedback collector endpoint. Uh, the feedback collector reformats this data and sends it via Kafka via the Kafka queue into the main recommendation update component. This is a continuous application component that runs in parallel over multiple Apache SPAR workers, which upon receiving item feedback for a user, updates the cache of the recommendations in real time based on that feedback. 
and what are, this is this would be the application what are we going to see next how are we going to see, to to make in the demo, uh, we will start uh, injecting uh, activity to the system from FlexiBench. In from FlexiBench, we will be able to to inject the different types of events, the, the ones I showed previously. Um, these events will be uh, will be uh, processed by the system. We will see be that uh, sorry that activity via the adaptive visualizations component. Uh, and, and from that uh, company, we will be able to see how the feedback collector is processing data and how the model is uh, updating. Okay, now let's move to the to the demo itself. The demo will use, as as I explained in in the previous day, two components of big data stack. The big data stack, uh, FlexiBench. From this tool, we are going to to inject activity into the system, uh, and the adaptive visualization. In adaptive visualization, we will be displaying uh, how the events are being are entering into the system. In the in this diagram on the on the right chart, we will see the 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 number of events. Uh, the incoming events, and here we will see how the the how the the average uh, for each category of products is changing. Calculate the, the average calculated by the recommender is changing according to the, to the processing of of the different incoming events. Okay. Now, what we are going to do is to inject basically two. We will be creating uh, two clients. Uh, and each client will open two different threads. In this, in each thread, we have we are injecting 50 operations. This is something we have defined in the in the in this file. Is uh, this guy is uh, defining the 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 type of activity we are we are going to do. And and in this file, we define, for example, the the number of of events of each category that are going to be processed, the number of events that are going to be processed for each thread, and and, and things like that. Okay. Uh, so now let's we are going to start injecting two uh, one hundred events. And as the system starts to process, we will start to to see how this uh, chart is uh, is increasing. Its number is changing. As I mentioned, this might take a while, so maybe you need to switch to the benchmarking tab. Okay, and you will see some information on the page. So the, the client contain no, no, not this one. Sorry. Um, you are the SIPO notifications, or you can go to the control long running masters. Uh, you can zoom out a bit. Get running masters. Uh, if you select option, yeah. So the master hasn't started yet. Okay. Uh, it needs a while to. If you can press it again, the get running uh, masters. Yeah. George, uh, could we start in the background before Bernard start the presentation? Now it has started. Now it has started. So you can select it again. Now, yeah. Now we can see here how the the feedback is is coming to the system. Now the, the feedback has been saved by the feedback collector and is going through the Kafka queue to the to the model updater. As soon as the model updater updates the the 
the recommendation model, we will start to, to see here some, some figures. Okay, we have to check uh, the reason why why it was not working. Uh, anyway, we have a, a, a video uh, recorded on which this is working. In case you're interested, uh, we can we can also play it now. So we'll uh, pass the floor to to the next presenter. Uh, please introduce the, the next part of the demo. Say something like we are going to see the runtime adaptation of, of the, of the, of the okay. demo. Okay, and in the next uh, coming minutes, you will see the runtime adaptations uh, of the of the demo. Okay. 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 So, thank you, Bernat. I will. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay, so you can see the screen, right? Yes. So I am going to show the random adaptation. Uh, what we are going to see here, it's uh, how the data-driven infrastructure works for managing an issue. Uh, in this case, we are going to simulate a high load uh, of requests, and we are going to have to change the deployment of the feedback collector in order to improve the response time. So, uh, what we are going to see right now is how a monitoring request from the realization engine arrives to the dynamic orchestrator. Uh, the dynamic orchestrator will then communicate to the quality of service evaluation uh, by sending uh, an enriched monitoring request or quality of service monitoring request that includes information about all of the SLOs that the quality of service will need to monitor during the, the runtime of this application. The quality of service will communicate via RabbitMQ with the dynamic orchestrator and also the triple monitoring engine in order to uh, check these metrics and generate alerts in case an SLO is violated. Um, so now I'm going to show you the demo. Uh, in this case, I have recorded the video that, that I'm going to show right now because of timing. Uh, Basically, the, the generation of the load takes some time, and then also the the adaptation takes some time, and I think it's better to synchronize it this way. We can discuss afterwards if we want to show the, the real demo or with the video, it's better. So here uh, we can see that the dynamic orchestrator is going to receive the monitoring request from the realization engine. We see that the um, that we cons uh, we start to consume the metrics from the application of the feedback collector, and we have one map time of two minutes. The dynamic orchestrator also sends the enriched playbook to the quality of service, and it also receives the actions that it can perform during runtime to adapt uh, the deployment. We see here on Grafana how we start the application. Uh, in this case, we have to wait for the warm-up time. The warm-up time, it's meant uh, for stability in the system. So for example, whenever we deploy a new instance of an application, we might need to wait a bit. We see that the dynamic orchestrator starts receiving the quality of service uh, information. We see, for example, here that we have received the cost per hour. Uh, soon, we are going to start also receiving the response time. Here we see it. Uh, whenever all of the new metrics uh, have been received by the, by the dynamic is taken in the reinforcement learning framework. We are now going to increase the load uh, that the application has to, to, to manage. This is going to increase the response time in order to violate the SLO. We have a, an SLO for a response time that is set to 100 milliseconds. So now here we can see how the how the response time is going up. This is accelerated in order to see it quicker. And we how the dynamic orchestrator takes the next reinforcement learning step 
uh, in which it will see that the response time is already elevated, violating this SLO, and then it's going to take any action that is going to add a new recommender. This is going to be communicated to the realization engine, and the realization engine is going to take uh, to deploy a new instance of the feedback collector. We now see on Grafana, this takes a little bit. Here we see the new instance has already been created. We see how the response time starts to, to change. And whenever a new instance is deployed, we receive a new monitoring request to the dynamic orchestrator so we can ensure that the um, response time SLO can be uh, monitored. So we see how the response time changes. It needs a little while to, to stabilize, like I said before. But here we can see how it goes down, and it goes down the 100 milliseconds. So here we can see just as a summary uh, where we had the SLO. Here we start the, the load uh, for the application. We see how the response time goes up. The dynamic orchestrator adds an instance here. Uh, and when it kicks in, the new uh, instance manages to, to draw the response time down, and then we get back to a stable state where no SLOs are violated. So um, now I'm going to go back to um, Antonio for the conclusion. Okay, the engineer is going to, to make this part of the, of the, the end of the, this part of the demo. So we just saw the uh, interaction between the uh, the dynamic orchestrator, the realization engine, which um, trigger action in the platform, and also with uh, the trooper monitoring engine, which collect metrics and evaluate the compliance of uh, an SLO with the preference the preference determined by the application owner. <clears throat> so the demo uh, uh, that we just showed. Um, was um, the completion of uh, a work that has been done uh, during the three years of this project. And we can manage to readapt an application dynamically based on the load that the application is receiving. Thank you. This is... <laughs>